I'm delighted now to be joined by Michael Fabricant, Conservative Member of Parliament for Lichfield, who I think it is fair to say takes a slightly different view. Uh, Michael, d Rory did give a very clear, crisp, calm, crucially, analysis of the faults. Is your defence that either he's innocent or that he isn't guilty of that much that really matters? Well, my defence, first of all, is very much contrary to all the comments that Rory so eloquently made. Look, Rory is a lovely guy, uh, very able, very articulate. Uh, he was speaking to you from Jordan. He's operating on a day-to-day -day basis from New Haven in Connecticut in the United States, where Yale is based. And, you know, he's like so many of the commentary, very out of touch with, I would argue, the reality of what on the ground. Firstly, he said that, you know, he can't run an effective government. Well, this government developed the best vaccine program in the world. We were the first to start the vaccine program. We've got the biggest economic growth rate in the G7. I could go on and on, but I'll just finish with one thing on that point, that the World Health Organization said two weeks ago that the United Kingdom could be the very first country in the Northern Hemisphere to actually leave the pandemic. And, and, and that's fantastic news. And also, he talks uh, now, let about... Me, let me come in there. Let, let me come sure. in. That one could equally argue yeah. that the COVID rollout was, was, was as much as anything down to clever civil servants, good NHS people, and Nadim Zahawi, uh, and, and secretaries of state, and the economy, Chancellor of the Exchequer, and not least Rishi. But I, I hear what you uh, say. But he, and did I, say I, yeah, yeah. But but he did say that he couldn't run an effective government, and that, therefore, ministers wouldn't know what to do. The great thing about Boris is he doesn't play by the rules. That's his weakness too. But by not playing by the rules, he didn't decide to go with the European vaccine programme, okay. as everybody said he should do. Instead, he said, let's go it alone. Talking of playing it by the rules, uh, for all politicians of, of, of any persuasion, uh, the truth matters. Boris Johnson went from there were no parties to, OK, there were parties, but I wasn't there to, OK, I was there, but it was work. It looks thin at best. At worst, it looks contrived and dishonest, yet you stand by him. I do stand by him because, first of all, there's the definition of when is a party a party. Is having drinks uh, during the course of an 18-hour workday with people that you'd been working with anyway in the same work bubble, and don't forget they were designated in law as key workers. So I genuinely think that he thought at the time it wasn't illegal and that he wasn't breaking any rules. And we'll find out whether he was breaking rules or not. But I don't think he actually thought, you know what? It's one rule for me, one rule for everybody else, because he thought that he was abiding by the rules because he wasn't spreading the disease. These were all people working closely together. And as for whether a thing is actually a party, well, we know that some parties went on. But you know what? You had uh, Keir Starmer saying he should be blamed for every party, even those parties he knew nothing about, if indeed you can call them parties, and when, in fact, he was 45 miles away at Chequers and wouldn't have known anything about uh, middle-ranking civil servants having leaving parties. OK. Those who've submitted letters calling for a vote of, of no confidence am amongst your colleagues range from people that, that, to be brutally honest, folk out there need to Google to find out who they are, uh, to the usual suspects, you included, <laughs> going the other way, but people like David Davis, who, who we know what the differences are there. But when someone like Nick Gibb says it, and saying that the Prime Minister simply can't be trusted, that is much more worrying. Well, you have to ask what are the motives and, you know, maybe they were completely honourable in Nick Gibbs' case. Maybe he felt miffed because um, it was Boris who, you know, eventually said, look, enough's enough. You've been a good schools minister, but you now need to move on and go back onto the back benches. A lot of people get very upset by that sort of thing. And uh, I can understand that. But the point is, I think, at the end of the day is First of all, is he popular? Yes, he is. Uh, yesterday, I was in Erdington, which is where there's a by-election due to the very, very sad loss of uh, Jack Dromey. 
And I was talking to and looking at the data for a ward where a very, very detailed survey had been done, a ward which was Labour controlled on the local council, uh, hadn't gone conservative at all. And I can't give the exact figures because I'll be in a lot of trouble, but over 60% of respondents were saying that they wanted Boris to stay. 15, over, just over 15% were saying, no, he should leave, and about 20% with don't knows. You know, the view in New Haven, Connecticut, and the view in central London is very, very different than the view held by most people out there who just want Boris to get on with it. I asked a question last night on my, my own social media account, and it's had over 4,000 responses, and it, it's about three to one in favour of the Prime Minister. But you know as well as I do that the national opinion polls, and there's another one in the Sun newspaper this morning, all say that the folk out there think he's crossed a line and that he should go. And Jonathan Haslam, who used to work in number 10 in John Major's day, says it's embarrassing that folk like you and Nadine Dorries have to come out on television and defend the indefensible. Defend it, Michael. Because I think it is defendable. I think it's defendable because I don't think he thought he was breaking rules because, as I said earlier on, whether there were so-called parties or not, it was in a contained bubble of people who'd been working closely together all day and that therefore they weren't spreading the COVID disease. Many of these people have been working 18 hours nonstop and at the time, back in 2020, were actually sourcing vaccines uh, which hadn't yet been developed. But if you remember, we bought the advanced rights to Pfizer, AstraZeneca, Moderna, and three other vaccines, uh, which we well ahead of everybody else. And, you know, the team were exhausted. There are over 400 people working at number 10. He recognizes that things were going wrong at the time. That's why there were going to be a number of sackings. Uh, or maybe we phrased it in a different way at the beginning of this week, and some jumped before they were pushed. I do think the appointment of Steve Barclay is an excellent choice. And Gitar Harry, um, ex-BBC, ex-GB News, actually, very briefly, um, I think will make an excellent right. director of communications because he's a moral person too. I think Michael. Boris is a wild character. But, you know, people find that sort of wild characteristic rather, rather endearing in a way, but he needs Done. tighter control. Michael, I, I, I was desperate to hear Rory's arguments and yours, but I want to try and keep it in balance as well on time. And, uh, and that's our time. Great for you to join us. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed. So that's Michael Fabricant there, the Conservative Member of Parliament for Litchfield.